and informative program lined up for you on this segment. We're going to be talking today with a respected and educated ufologist and lecturer on the highly controversial and speculative topics of Planet X and UFOs. In the prophecies of Nostradamus, one of the more famous predictions refers to the arrival uh, from a what we call a thing that will profoundly change life on Earth. Nostradamus refers to this thing as the great king of terror. Could Nostradamus have foreseen the coming of a celestial body that would wreak havoc here on Earth? Hopefully, we will get some definitive answers on just this and what is causing our Earth to leapfrog into a sudden tailspin. Our guest, Dr. Jason Rand, is a respected researcher and lecturer on the topic of UFOs. His contributions in the study and pursuit of extraterrestrial communications, research into UFO phenomena, cosmology, and his representing the United States at the first World UFO Congress in Tucson in 1991, earned him distinctive recognition and his doctorate from the Russian Academy of Sciences on December the 18th of 1992 in Moscow. Dr. Rand wrote a book in 2007 concerning a rogue planet, which some keen observers have reported as having a universally disturbing effect on our solar system and planet Earth in particular. The return of Planet X is an educational, informational source examining all aspects of this controversial subject, including the record of X's ancient science of prophecy its phantom astronomy, forbidden archaeology, and the signs of its approach. Welcome to our show, Jason. Thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with your audience today. Thank you. In your book, The Return of Planet X, you explain the extreme dangers uh, potentially posed by Planet X, which uh, another name for it is Wormwood. Uh, now, I have uh, personally been uh, hearing many things about Planet X uh, since I first became interested in the subject back at the beginning of uh, 2003. But um, for those listening who may be hearing about the planet for the first time, I wonder if you could explain to all of us what exactly Planet X is and when did you first begin your research on this uh, mystical planet? All right. First of all, Let's define what a brown dwarf star is. A brown dwarf star is usually a smaller celestial body that is a, either a failed or an unignited fusion sun. Our sun is a fusion sun. It creates heat and energy. And that's what keeps us alive here on planet Earth. Now, we believe that I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump back and forth here, but I'm going to answer all four questions in this one explanation. We believe that about four and a half to five billion years ago, during the formation of our solar system, which we believe, according to our research, and of course Sumerian te uh, technology and, and information and philosophy and sciences, all indicate that there were 12 planets originally formed in our solar system. 12, not the nine we have. And that about four and a half to five billion years ago, a very, very large uh, errant, object, possibly a huge asteroid, a, you know, a gigantic asteroid, crashed into one of the 12 planets, which was called Marduk, according to Sumerian cosmology, Marduk. And when this collision occurred, Marduk shattered into billions of pieces, some very large, some, some much smaller, and most of the, of the debris that came off of Marduk was what eventually formed, they believe, our asteroid belt. All right? Okay. All right, so far so good. Now, a large piece of this planet, this Marduk, apparently flew off into space, and it happened to collide head-on with this little baby sun, this unignited uh, fusion sun, which was still in its infancy uh, as, as captured by our, our, the gravity of our sun. All right? And it hit it at such an angle that it knocked it completely out of its regular orbit. Okay, we have to jump for a second. All of the planets in our solar system rotate in a counterclockwise motion. 
just envision that. In other words, all of the planets are circling the sun in a counterclockwise motion. So we're talking about an ecliptical plane then, right? Yes, okay. exactly. And this particular body, when it was struck, was so impacted that it spun it out in, its, in, an, in an almost 180-degree trajectory, which then sent it on a clockwise motion around the sun rather than a counterclockwise and that it hit it so hard that it knocked it into a very long, elongated between 3,600 and 4,000 year orbit way out into the deep reaches of space, way beyond Pluto, way, way out there, and then coming back and circling back. And we think, at least the theory in our book, and now substantiated, by the way, did you know that there are over 100 books out on Planet X right now? And I'm Really? Yes, but I'm pleased to say that we were one of the first ones, one of the first ones, not the first one, to be able to get to press and get it into distribution before this phenomenon really hit the Internet, because this was a seven-year project in the making. All right. So this celestial object gets knocked out into this huge elliptical orbit. Um, imagine, um, Steve, if you had a very large rubber band and you, you gripped it at both ends and you pulled it in opposite directions, what you'd create is an imaginary elliptical orbit. That's, that's what it looks like. Okay? So, at every 3,600 to 4,000 years, we believe this physical object, this unborn sun, this smoldering brown dwarf planet, it could be the size of our moon, it could be the size of the Earth, it could be even larger. That I'm not able to, to affirm one way or the other. It is certainly as large as the moon in any event because of its mass and what it's already creating throughout its approach into our solar system. Okay. I had actually heard that it might be as much as four times the size of the Earth. It could, yes. It, it Which would put it in comparison with uh, the planet Jupiter, is that correct? Jupiter, or? yes, that is absolutely correct. I mean, that, that would be its extreme. I think, personally, I think it's somewhere in between. But let's, let's go on back to its oncoming passage, okay? All right. So we believe, according to the research in our book, and by the way, the last time this object came through, at least according to the research that we did, by the way, we had to read 2,000 books over a period of seven years, and I've referenced all those books uh, with reference points throughout our book so that a person could go back and check the information. We found out that it's now believed that the last time Planet X, the object we're talking about, this brown dwarf star, this mystery object coming from space. The last time it came through, we believe, was in the year 1447 BCE, before the Common Era, which means before Christ. And it just happens to coincide with the Exodus, when Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt. They were in bondage for 400 years under Pharaoh. And that could very well explain a lot of the miracles that were attributed to to Moses' rod. Remember when he threw it down and it turned into a serpent? Correct. Biblically? Okay. Yep. This would also explain the rivers turning the blood color because of the red dust, the skies turning red, the, the moon and the sun seemingly stopped, and there, there just happens to be that there was a huge volcanic eruption nearby, not too far, and also a huge earthquake. All of this occurred when Moses, they were like signs from God. Okay, now if we're right, but also explain how the red how the how the, how the red sea uh, parted because if it sloshed in its basin because of a large earthquake, wouldn't the water move to one side? But did it remain, actually pour? Remain I mean, there. The is it actually ported, or did it actually just move off to one side enough to where uh, uh, Moses and his people could cross? Yeah, it, I doubt if it. I doubt if it parted like we saw in. The, in remember in the original movie? Then yeah, we see parting in, in two different directions. Yeah, no. I think that would probably happen, most logically so, was that there was this huge earthquake. It sloshed the, 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 the lake out of its basin, at least partially so, allowed the Israelites to go through, and then nature takes over. The planet, you know, realigns herself, and the water comes back. I mean, that's the most logical explanation. Yes, it was a miracle. I'm not saying it wasn't a religious miracle. I'm only saying it sure happened at the right time at the right moment. Now, we were so fortunate, our book was picked as the top 
credited book on the subject, and we're right on the front page, and we're really proud of that. And I have to tell you, I just I'm so pleased at it. It it, it came with great sacrifice because we've been we've been giving our books to libraries and things like that, and now people are starting to call in. I've had requests from the White House and the Hoover Foundation and a whole bunch of other organizations. It's gratifying, and we thank you. What is the interest? And we in thank the White you for House? having us on. What what is the White House interested in this? What, for what what? Well, I just I just got a, an email request. Uh, would it would it, we please send a book to the attention of the of the science advisor for the White House? And we did. I haven't heard anything back yet. It's only been a couple of months. That's not unusual. They must get a thousand books a month. You know what I mean? Okay. But anyway, so they requested it, and and I'm I was grateful for it. But I haven't heard uh, what what the feedback is yet. Um, however, I am this coming uh, next Wednesday. I am meeting with the senatorial aide to one of the two senators here from Mississippi, um, uh, Thad Cochran, and I'm going to be presenting them a copy of the book, and I'm going to ask for a meeting with the senator the next time that he's at the state capitol, because I believe Mississippi, which of course where I live, is very is going to be very vulnerable for this forthcoming hurricane season. Well, because it's it's cyclical, but the planet is ratcheting itself up. You see, when you're talking the the science and the chemistry and the philosophy of something as complicated as planet Earth, nothing happens faster because it's so big. But what is happening is that it's something that cannot be stopped. The planet itself is getting ready to go through this huge transition. It feels it. It knows it's coming. It happens every thirty-six to four thousand years. Let let let's cruise into something real interesting. Let's just assume that we could take off our rational thinking caps and just put on our well, what if? Let's explore cap and say, suppose the Earth itself is a living entity and a being with a soul and a mind, and that it reasons. It just does all these things in ways which we are unable to communicate with. Now, if you understand how the planet functions and how it works, you have to understand that its primary flow and rotation and and dynamic principles, including plate tectonics, all occurs because of interaction with the planet's core. Okay, If something affects the core of our planet, it could affect its rotation, its speed, its plane of inclination. A lot of things can happen. And I believe that the core, the center core of planet Earth, has been in an excitation phase for possibly as long as six to seven years. It started about six or seven years ago, very, very slowly. Because well, what's, your, what's your take on um, some of these uh, skeptics out there? Uh, you know, and of course, you know, we got a lot of these global warming skeptics too that are running around saying everything is, is of a natural uh, occurrence. But what's your take on those skeptics who say that uh, the activity that might be going on in the Earth's core is because of activity that's now occurring uh, on the surface of the sun? They're absolutely correct. They're they're absolutely correct. I was I was on my way to that. I was about to say that the core of our planet could be most affected by what happens on the core of the sun and what the sun's energies and emissions are transmitted to us we receive huge amounts of solar radiation and that is what from the sun that is what heats and also causes weather and cools the planet now if that were severely disrupted or changed it would change all the dynamics of how the planet operates its weather systems its rotational patterns its seasonal its inclinations all of these things are affected by what happens to its core and we think that this incoming body has been affecting the inner core of the sun because of its mass and therefore when the core of the sun gets excited it sends out more energy and more types of radiation and i believe some kinds that we don't even totally understand yet okay we've never ever been affected by a brown dwarf star in modern day times if this is what we think and i think it is and i ask you the question why did they spend billions and billions of dollars to build a quote top secret solar observatory at the south pole in the yeah there's a lot of, of speculation about that now too you know. sure why do you think they built it i believe that they simply built it because that'll be the greatest viewing position for this body as it comes swinging in 
from underneath the solar system starting to arc up and over it. It's going to be coming up from the south. It's been emerging from the glare of the sun for the last 15 to 20 years on its approach to us. All the time that it's been speeding toward us during this 36 to 4,000 year period, most of it has been because it's coming from behind the sun. We can't possibly see it. We can't see through the sun. We can barely see through the glare around the sun, you see? So if we're right, and if a lot of the present-day cosmologists, and by the way, this is a subject that's under study all around the world. I, I, I just returned from Russia. I was there for about 20 days. And I had a chance to sit and talk with a colleague of mine, um, Colonel Marina Popovich, the, the, the Russian heroine test pilot lady. She's, she and I have been friends right, for like 20 right. years. Anyway, we talked exclusively, and I had a chance to talk to some of the people from the academy. And they take this very seriously. They're now conducting their own studies. They are, they are not open to the public. They are, they are quiet studies. They're not, they're not secret or kept, kept in secret, but until the facts are disclosed, the information is really being carefully digested. They have now, their own, academy, they have their own solar, solar situ, uh, they're going to be taking their own pictures from the South Pole. They're making arrangements now. Oh, okay. Are they, are they an independent entity from the government, the Russian government? It, uh, y yes and no. They're under the auspices of the Russian government, but they are totally independent. All, that kind of control ended when the wall came down. Things are much more open there. So it's the Russian government's uh, position With as their well approval. that something is going on. Yes, the, the government officially says this is your business. You do it. We don't. You know, we're out of it. We, we're into other things. Okay. Which is which I think is intelligent and and sensitive to the fact that sometimes you have to be unobstructed in order to get the mission done. All right. Something, by the way, has been pertubing many of the outer planets, and they now believe that it's this planet X. By the way, did you know that NASA, this is, first of all, this is not even a new story. If I was to tell you that in 1982, NASA itself published this huge story. By the way, that article in the Washington Post and the Washington Times and, and Globe, all of those stories are included in our book, The Return of Planet X. Well, aren't they, they claiming that that was a mistake on their part? Uh, yes. This, uh, reporting? No, not a mistake. They were, yeah. the, the people at NASA were so excited that one of their telescopes had found something that they blurted it without running it through the White House and, and the Pentagon and, and all of the think tanks. Well, this kind of news could have completely rattled everybody across the planet if it was true. So immediately, the Washington Times jumped on it, the Globe and also the New York Times, and they ran with stories in the next day or two. Suddenly, those stories were instantly pulled. All the newscasts were cleansed. There was never another word about it, and to this day, they still don't talk about it. But it's been in print. They announced it as early as 1982, and it's been basically pigeonholed, covered up, whatever you want to call it. By the way, I'm not a conspiracy buff. I don't, I don't see conspiracy <laughs> everywhere. A lot of people in my field do, and I don't. I'm very realistic about what is and what isn't. However, there are certain things that are being you know, conspiratorial and being covered up, like the Roswell incident, as just one for instance. Well, what was the precise position of Planet X back in 1982 when NASA first discovered it? I think that they somehow they, they cited it from a distant probe. I, I think, I'm not exactly sure. I've tried to find this out. I've, I've got friends inside and we can't, it just can't talk about it. It's, it is so weird and so dark a subject to them because they know that there's nothing we can do about it. See, I guess the reason they don't want to talk about it is there's nothing they can really do about it. You know, all, remember the movie Armageddon when they sent out the, the two spaceships? And right. They, that's, that's not, no, that's not right. I didn't mean, it's not feasible. It doesn't work that way. We wouldn't have enough resources to launch three vehicles if we had to, okay? But the point is, I guess what they're doing is they're slowly getting the government ready. Now, I will say that. I think that there, if, if there's a conspiracy going on to cover it up, I also have to say that I think they're smart enough to know. I do believe that Denver, Colorado would become Washington West, by the way. I used to live in Denver. I, I really liked it there. I was there for about three years. 
Yeah, I believe there's an under, some kind of underground uh, facility there for the for the VIPs. Yes, and there's a whole government center built under the Capitol. It's it's they've been they've been doing this very quietly. We, we have a U.S. Mint. We, are we, I'm not there. They have a U.S. Mint. They have a world class zoo. They have one of the most important airports ever built in the United States. That airport is far more than an airport. I really don't want to go into it because that should be the subject of another show for us, by the way. Okay. All right. They are preparing Denver for what I believe would be a rush to the west if something should devastate the east coast. All right? Now, why would Denver be a uh, safe haven for these people? You you mean in in, in terms of earth changes? Well, Denver would certainly be subject to probably some earthquakes and some shaking, but it's not going to get, I don't think it will get any volcanic problems unless Yosemite goes. If Yosemite goes, you know about Yosemite, right? Yes. Yes, it's a super volcano, We have what's known as a super volcano right smack in the middle of our country that could blow it apart, that could literally tear the continent in half. Now, that's another sub- that's another whole show right there. <laughs> I mean, they All have right. specials on these things, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> National Geographic, you can find almost anything on what we're talking about. So you see, the kinds of things, Stephen, that we're talking about are not so hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo, crazy p- paranoia stuff. Oh no, this is real stuff. That's this going is on. all real you stuff. That. Have you have you watched the Weather Channel lately? L- let me ask you something. It used to be when you turned on the Weather Channel, what you had was a really interesting of banter and, and chit-chat and talk about this and that, and it's raining here and it's thundering over there. Now it's all about nothing but disasters, forest fires, wildfires, earthquakes, um, sinkholes, tornadoes, hurricanes, w- straight-line winds. Well, they, refer to, it, and they refer to it as uh, extreme events. Yeah, we're kind of in the grips of a really bad extreme event, but nobody wants to really call it that. Listen, we've got high gas prices. We've got a difficult election coming up. We've got terrorists sniffing up our blouses. We, we've got uh, problems possibly with fuel disruptions. We've got a dysfunctional Congress, Senate and legislature. And I can go on and on and on and on, okay? Everybody's default, by the way. There is nobody there in Washington that is really functioning like an American citizen should function as to what is best for the country. Well, I certainly okay, agree no, with that. Enough about that. I didn't mean to go there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's true, Stephen. And all of this is about to come down on their shoulders, and they're still talking about Now, if I'm right about this coming hurricane season, and that's the reason I'm going to meet with Senator Thad Cochran, his aide on Wednesday and then request a meeting with the senator, is that Mississippi is not ready. I've been talking. I took a trip down there. I've been looking around. People aren't really aware of about what's to happen. I'm afraid that the Gulf Coast region is going to get hit by a very bad hurricane. Oh, it's very bad. All the way from Texas to Florida. So. it could it could hit anywhere. I think it's going to hit Louisiana and Mississippi this time. Well, I hate to uh, hear that because being I'm is, right in the middle of all that. <laughs> I know you are. You're in Baton Rouge. Yep. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. That's how they say it. Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. I'm I'm pretty good at linguistics. Which, by the way, is an Indian term for the red stick. Yes. Yes. Incidentally, speaking of Indians. We cover a whole section in the book on on ancient legends and cosmology of all these groups. Who do you think was giving them all this celestial information? I don't think it was the magic mushroom, do you? I think they were getting hard information from extraterrestrial beings that are probably a, a half a million years ahead of us in evolution and in technology. I mean, that's another whole show as a child, I was on a ship in, at age 11 up in Canada. It's long and in, involved, and, and it was just meant to let you know that I know these things are real. That's what set me on my course to write this book in the first place. I was shown at age 11 in 1950 a complete display uh, when I was on the ship. They, they wanted me... I, okay, whew, I was part of a group of children that they were harvesting, meaning that... They were investing in having experiences with us mentally and spiritually. 
and I would go on OBEs. You know what an out-of-body experience is? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I used to go out at age 5, 6, 7, and 8 in OBEs that they would let me remember. And I was going to this big classroom setting where there were thousands of other children, just like myself, all happy and healthy. And we were like being scanned to find out if if we would like to participate in, in help, and to be helpmates for humanity. In other words, AIDS. The reason I wrote this book was not to scare anybody. It was to tell everybody, we got to do this. Let's take, you know, put our gloves on. Let's get to work. We got a lot to do. There's going to be a lot happening to the planet. I believe there's going to be a huge exodus. I believe there's going to be a huge liftoff by the ETs of billions and billions of people who are mentally, spiritually, and physically tuned to the planet and understand the dynamics of metaphysics. Well, we're seeing more and more of that every day. In fact, there was something in, uh, that just happened the other day in uh, Devon, in the in, uh, U.K. Uh, a number of people saw several UFOs flying around in a 45-degree angle. Yes. It, and said it was the, the, the most unusual thing they have ever seen in their entire lives. One of the things I'm going to predict, let's, let's go public on your show, okay? I, I'm predicting as of today that we are going to be seeing a gradual but surely increasing rate of UFO sightings, landings, contacts, and communications. And I think we're starting to just now begin to see it form. What, what, is, it that the, what is it that the aliens, are the aliens trying to communicate with us to warn us of what's about to happen? Or what, what is their specific purpose in, in showing themselves? All, all of the above. You, you hit right on it. The crop circle thing, if, you really, if people really understood what, the, what crop circles are all about. Now, let's throw away the fakers and let's throw away the little guys that run around with broomsticks. Those are not what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you really understand the phenomena and if you've really had a ch I've had a chance to look at the Russian evidence up close, and it is absolutely astounding. If you know anything about crop circle technology, which is another show. Here we go again. You know? Absolutely. All right. Everything's another show, correct? Absolutely. Well, <laughs> you know, do you realize the kind of ground you and I are covering in this time right now? I I feel like I'm, I feel, this, by the way, this is how I conduct a lot of my lectures. It's it's kind of free for all with the audience. And by the time we get rolling, the information starts coming as it's coming now. But let, let, let's go back to, to answering your question specifically about the ETs. Okay. Yes, of, of course they're communicating with us. They've never not been communicating with us. If you understand anything about the field of ufology, it's still considered to be very, very controversial. And you know what, Stephen? That's good because that brings attention to it. But it's, I think it's beginning, to, beginning now to become mainstream. Um, I think one of the latest polls conducted, possibly Gallup, I'm not sure, something like, Overwhelmingly, 68 to 75 percent of the population no more has any doubts about UFOs and ETs and flying saucers and all the movies and everything we know. And yes, of course, there's space people out there, and if they're here, so what? People are almost blasé to the fact. How much Star Trek can you absorb? <laughs> or Star Wars? Or Indiana Jones? The, the point of the matter is, the public is not stupid. The public is. The public has been seeing science fiction UFO movies since the early 1950s. Remember the day the Earth stood still? Correct. With fact, and... We were playing the music there just at the beginning of this show. Yes, you were. I just wanted <laughs> to get just wanted to get that in. So, let's let's give everybody a break and let's just open the door and open the files and say, "You know what? The United, you know, did you know that the United States, Great Britain, New Zealand, Canada, and and Australia and a few of these other sober Western countries, they're the only ones that have secret UFO information files that haven't been opened. So I find role, that very the, ironic. And you know what? All of this? Whatever. What's the government's role in all of this? And, and, and what's, this, uh, what's, this, what's this going on over there at this uh, Area 51? In, well, in Area 50, okay, well, let's see. Okay, there's a couple of questions in one again. Okay, let's go at both questions with this, with this explanation. Okay. UFO 51, there, there are a dozen TV specials you can rent, by the way, or you can cl click in for or buy on Area 51, but I'll give you a recap. Area 51 used to be a very, very top secret um, 
air base deep in the heart of the Nevada desert, not, not too far out of Las Vegas. Uh, Nellis Air Force Base is associated with it, where they've built some very sophisticated um, labs, hangars, where they do top-notch and, and top-secret black ops uh, experimenting on airplanes and airfoils and things like that. It's also rumored to be where they have back-engineered several crashed what we call flying saucer disks. That's been the big UFO, you know, secret thing that people have been investigating. Well, they've uncovered more information than they ever thought they would, and after everybody poo-poos them, the government still denies it, but you still can't get access, and you're arrested if you try to take one step on the land. They got you. So I guess where there's smoke, once again, there must be some fire. So that's the story in Area 51. It's still top secret, supposedly. They, they are still doing their engineering. You can't get anywhere near it. Now, what is, what, is it, what is the government really doing? They're doing nothing. They're not doing anything to help or harm it because there's so much else going on to distract the public. They don't have to cover this thing up the way, you know, they, they should have to do it. Okay? Now, with the danger of this, these incoming objects or this object, I believe all of these things are now going to come gushing out gushing out of the glove that they've had it contained in, you know. And I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a glut of information suddenly left open, not not by accident, but by design. And I am going to talk to our senator about the fact that the government should now disclose this information. So I'm going to start to lobby him to find out if there's any interest uh, in Congress or in the Senate of opening up these gates, I think it would get, make the people feel a lot better going into the election if they knew what was going on. Would well, you how, are they going, how are they going to explain to the masses that for all these years they've been covering up the fact that something is going on in outer space <coughs> uh, that's affecting um, uh, the Earth, changes affecting our climate, and then using this excuse that it all has to do with global warming? Well, maybe it does have something to do with global warming, but obviously there's a celestial body up there that's creating quite a bit of what's going on. How are they well, going to explain themselves? Oh, well, it's quite simple. It's two words, national security. <laughs> it's a na na matter of national security. Look, it's totally, totally reasonable. I think they probably did. Looking back, you know, here I am, the first proponent to say, I know they're covering it up. Listen, you have to cover something like this up until you understand it. Do you follow me? You yep. can't go public on something you don't understand. You're not even sure is going to happen, but you sure feel the heat coming under your heels, okay? They did the right thing. They kept it quiet. But now it's time. Uh, is the, has the country been prepared for almost a full year? Every, do you realize that every week since, since the fall of 2007, from the fall of 2007, every single week, including all the winter months, there has been a tornado somewhere in the United States of America. Right. And they're still continuing even today. It's been an uninterrupted tornado season. But that's normal. No, it's not normal. What's not normal are the temperatures. I did an interview this morning with a DJ in Denver. It is the hottest cycle of weather they've had in 200 years. 200 years. That's significant. That tells you that there's something wrong. Okay? Now, we need to understand what's happening, not only climate-wise, but what's going to happen to the rest of the world if we should suddenly get some big natural disasters. Do you remember the 9.0 quake that struck Indonesia uh, in the winter of 2004 to 2005? Do you remember that? Yeah, correct. I think that was uh, the, it December It created that huge tsunami no. disaster. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Stephen, consider this. 250 over over 250,000 people died instantly in 45 seconds. That's right. In 45 minutes. In 45 minutes. The That's how long it took for the for the waves to arrive, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. To the various locations. It wasn't just one location. It hit it hit in numerous locations. Right. So, mostly the within point, the Indian Ocean, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. The the point of even bringing this up is the fact that we're not prepared. We're not even thinking about it. We're too concerned about the election, which we should be anyway. But the point is, this is all about to come down on our shoulders. Now, we've got to start thinking rationally about what we're doing. And that's another reason why I wrote the book, hyphen x.com. Interesting, can I tell you a really quick, funny something? I've got, I've got a section on, 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 on my website where 
I put on what was sent to me a submission by by a guy who insists that the Earth's inclination has is now beginning to to, to tilt, and he's got all the dynamics. So he sent me a beautiful uh, graphic. So I put it up, and, and suddenly it disappeared last week. And there was a sign that came up that said "deceased." Oh Lord! <laughs> I think the government had a little fun with me at my expense. So uh huh. I'm getting ready to reload, and I'm going to talk to the senator about this, too. <laughs> Isn't that cute? See, they don't want to talk about anything that might suggest that there's something wrong. Well, I do believe we are tilting. I believe the tilt has already started. Let, let, really me, ta- let me ask you something about this tilt. Do you think that maybe this has something to do with the uh, fluctuation in weather that's occurring, whereas in Canada right now it's as it's, it's hot as hell? Or in some other part of the country, it's, it's as cold as can be right now? Oh, sure. Every, everything, everything's tipsy-topsy-turvy. Nothing's working right. The, the inner core of our planet is being heated up and excited by the core of the sun. The sun, the sun itself is doing it. And as so, I believe it's starting to spin faster. See, I, I think that the amount of radiation and energy that is exciting the core of our, our planet, this is what is causing it to speed up. And as it speeds up, it heats up, and therefore, I believe that it's starting now to send lava out to all the volcanic mounts. I think that we are are in the process of having the planet come alive like it was designed to do to rebuild itself. You see where I'm going with this? Right. Yep. I think we're going to a series of huge earthquakes and volcanic events, and I think it's what the planet would normally be doing anyway because of the return of this object. Now... It does so happen that it happens to coincide with a lot of religious thinking, especially the evangelicals. They believe that we are now at the end times. And I believe that we are at definitely at some kind of end time operation for this planet the way the way it's now functioning. What's I think the Vatican's we're, position? We're about to hit the wall. What's the Vatican's position on this? I understand they have a telescope mounted somewhere in Arizona. No, they've got three or four of them all around the world. Uh-huh. Well, the Arizona one is probably probably your most expensive and, and the one, one that's fitted with the infrared. But you see, that's off limits. That is top secret. No one gets in and no one, no, no one has access. That's it, period, and as are all their other observ- observatories. What's their position? Well, let me jump back. I've had a chance to talk to somebody who spoke to the last remaining survivor of the three Portuguese children who witnessed the miracle at Fatima. Okay. Mm-hmm. The, the, the Jacinta, I, th- I think it was Jacinta. The, the, one of the two girls recently died, but I have a dear friend who had a chance to sit and talk with her at the Vatican. By the way, they, they brought her into the... She's been virtually living at the Vatican now for dozens of years. She was immediately well, I wasn't taken, aware of that. She was immediately, yes, she was immediately taken out of, and probably for her own good. I'm not saying anything sinister like that. Right. It was probably for her own good so she could be tended to, her needs, her health, and things of that nature. Because, you know, she, she was an average peasant person. Okay? Now, her and my friend's understanding is that the third secret of Fatima had to do with the return of this planetary body called Wormwood and that it would affect the Vatican and every structure in the Vatican, and it would, it, would, it would definitely impact the church's survival itself, the very survival of the church itself, and that they, were start, that they should have been getting ready for this. Now, maybe they have and maybe they haven't been getting ready, but the Vatican knows a heck of a lot more than they're telling us. So you see, it's one big kind of, you know, I don't want to use the word conspiracy, but nobody talks about it. Why? Because everybody knows that what's coming is inevitable. And I think that's what all the Mayan myths were all about. And I think that's what all this cosmology on the part of the ancients was all about. Because our research indicates, and that's what the book is all about. Wait do you read the prophecy section. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. By the way, do you know what remote viewing is? No. Remote viewing, remote viewing is a science that was developed in the early 70s using people with with extreme mental skills 
to transgress time and space and mentally view things. It's called remote viewing. They, they, Is that sort they, of like mental telepathy, or it's like, well, it's it's a form of telepathy, but in this case, it's sending your thoughts out as as information vehicles or cameras. It's 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 a real science. It was developed. I'm I'm good friends with one of the originators of it, uh, Dr. Hal Putoff. Uh, he had uh, involved with the Academy for Advanced Science in uh, in um, Austin, Texas. Anyway. Uh, I'm talking to him. I, I still haven't got the okay, but we're trying to put together a remote viewing opportunity, possibly working with the Russians, who are very much into remote viewing, by the way. They developed the same time we did, because they found out we were doing that to them, so they did it to us, and they beat us at it. We're talking about the much, Russians. They were that much better at it. Talking about the Russians now. Russians. Um, um, tell us about this uh, Russian Space Center training complex outside Moscow. It's called Star City. Star City. Yeah, how, how did you gain permission to uh, visit this, uh, this? I guess it's a cosmos, cosmonaut it's the site, Cosmonaut right? Training Center. Yeah. Just, just like Houston and, and Cape Canaveral. Okay. Um, because of my friendship with, with uh, now-retired uh, Colonel Morena Popovich, um, the famous lady test pilot, um, I visited... I, I revisited. Uh, I, I visited for the first time um, Moscow in in, uh, in 1992, and um, we we were invited by Morena. She okay. Her husband used to run Star City. Now, who was her here. husband? Uh, General Paul Pavel Popovich. And he was a cosmonaut, right? Yes, he was the second man in space. Okay. For Russia. And he ran that training center for a number of years, so they they maintained a very nice apartment complex there. And she now she has it. That that's her home when she's away. And Pavel has his, but it's in a different part of Star City. See, Star City is a vast complex carved out of the middle of a forest. It's it's at least I think it's eighty to ninety miles away from uh, Moscow. And the only way to get in there's one highway in, one two lane highway in. And one railroad in, and there's an airstrip, and that's it. So it's, it's a protected carved out of the forest for for like 60 miles. All you see is is a cut through the forest. Okay. Okay. So she invited us there. We spent the entire day, and um, we had dinner, and, and we had a chance to visit some of the facilities. Uh, I must tell you, it is one of the most Fascinating places. Imagine being taken through Houston. They have the same kind of machines and same kind of equipment and the and the and the wet tanks and all all of that kind of thing. So that's how I got a chance to visit there, and uh, we were the guests of uh, Morena, and it's something I will never forget. I couldn't take any pictures though. I'm on a mission to educate the planet about what could be its greatest opportunity to get control of itself. Okay, the whole planet, not just the United States. Not just Mexico, not just Canada, the entire planet is going is in for a rude uh, shakening. I like that a rude wake, a shakening. And it's going are we to be going? Horrendous. I know, I know what I know what's happening now. We're seeing it every day. But are you going to say? Uh, is it like like the prophet, uh, the uh, passage in the Bible that says that everything will happen uh, in increments, like a woman having a child? Yes. Is that the type of thing we're going to see, or is it going to happen quickly? We've already cracked the fifth seal. If you know anything about the book of Revelation, by the way, have you ever read or tried to interpret or understand the book of Revelation? As much as I can, but of course right. that's controversial. We go into great uh, detail. Uh, we, we go into great detail in the book about it. Okay, now here's what I think is happening. I'm going to jump right into the book of Revelation and talk about the fact that once you read up to the fifth seal, that's where we are at the present time. We're about ready to crack the sixth seal uh, within the book of Revelation. And I think that will be when Wormwood makes its first appearance. Then I think the sixth seal will have been opened. So I'm giving you what we think, based on biblical prophecy and research that we've done. Remember, we, we read 2,000 books. We have over 2,000 references in the text after each chapter. So that if someone wanted to go back and re and re research what we did, we give you you know the the publisher, the page number, the ibid, all all of the information for you to go back and check on our books. 
So, do you think do you think that could have been the uh, you know we mentioned at the beginning of the show the uh, the vision of Nostradamus back in the 15th century? Oh yes, oh yes. In which he uh, referred to a great monster in the sky. Of course, his his date was 1999 in the seventh month, which some people has have interpreted as the ninth month actually, which would have been September. Mm-hmm. So he may he may have been off uh, uh, you know a, a decade or so. But do you think that that was his vision? Well, I think what happened, if you look if you look back to that, give me that date again. Uh, his date was 1999, the seventh month. Seventh, well, that would have been July. Yeah. If it's the seventh month, it would have been July, okay. Yeah, 